<clears throat> Excuse me. Today's uh, topics uh, will be, as I said, will be presented by Mohammed, and and uh, the topic is uh, the contest area and gestures. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everybody: this session, this session, and the previous sessions, um, we didn't require Judo Ontario membership. After this session, all following clinics will require all participants to be members of Judo Ontario or another provincial associ judo association. And I'm sure many of you are saying, well, why should I join in just for these clinics? It's, it's a virtual clinic. I'm not even at a dojo or at a location. Well, let me begin by telling you first that Judo Ontario has reduced the 2020-21 uh, memberships by 30% on individual memberships pricing. Uh, the information was sent out in an email blast, but if you haven't received the information, either contact Judo Ontario or let me know and I can send you a copy. Um, I don't know if there'll be a refund um, uh, paid out to any of the people who have already uh, sent in, who have already paid. But more importantly, why should you join Judo Ontario? Well, all Judo Ontario and Judo Canada uh, activities like clinics, tournaments, sorry, my lighting plan, clinics, tournaments, uh, athlete coach and referee development and gradings are all, all require membership. True that none of these are happening right now due to COVID-19, but your membership helps support Judo Ontario and Judo Canada with ongoing operations. So we have Judo to come back to after we start up again. Uh, Judo Ontario is also covering the cost of this Zoom clinic. So the, the Zoom application that we're using is not free. So they're covering the cost. Um, your membership also indirectly and directly supports our provincial, national, and international athletes with programs, <laughs> management, coaching, et cetera. Uh, Long-term development, uh, high, um, the uh, high end uh, athletes, things like that. Um, the RDF, which is the Referee Development Fund, supports referees with out-of-province expenses and international oh, yeah. and national referee evaluation fees and development activities like these clinics. They're not funded by Judo Ontario. The RDF revenue is solely dependent on tournaments. So um, remember, no Judo Ontario means no Judo, means no Shi'ai, means no referees. Membership doesn't just help you, it helps everyone. And it's a way of giving back to the sport we all enjoy. So please join Judo Ontario. Uh, before we I hand, start, excuse me, before I hand things over to Mohammed, I just want to remind everybody to please go on mute if you're not talking. Thanks. Mohammed, it's up to you, thanks. Um, good, thank you, Jerry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it means a lot to Judo Ontario Referee Committee. Um, this started a few weeks back. We got together and we thought it has been too long that we have not communicated uh, anything referee related within the province. And the, uh, the concept of having these webinars started, we did not know. Uh, there are many seminars uh, I have attended personally and there are different formats. And the committee decided, hey, why don't we, our, our goal is to develop referee program in Ontario and expand it. Why don't we start from scratch? And the scratch was defined as we are going to follow the referee, uh, IGF referee manual, which I'm going to show you that if you're interested, you can actually go to IGF uh, website and you can print this. And I have done it myself, uh, print the pages and make it a hard copy out of it. So we decided to follow uh, the manual. So hopefully by the time the last seminar, we have gone through the whole manual, uh, which translate to, for some of the much more experienced referees, it might be some of the seminars or a portion of a seminar might be boring or too basic, but we thought it would be good to start from the scratch. Specifically speaking, the uh, subject tonight we are going to uh, discuss is the, uh, the contest area, the role of a referee within the contest area, and the gestures, which is, uh, in my opinion, and some of the experienced referees here would be basic, but it's good to always review for ourselves. 
and also for the people who are interested. And we are very happy that we heard there, um, there are a few people that they show an interest and they want to find out as the question was addressed earlier, that there is interest to start uh, uh, refereeing. So having said that, uh, excuse me for a few seconds, I'm going to try to uh, screen share and get my presentation ready. So just a couple of seconds. Um, uh, Jerry, it tells me that uh, the host has disabled my sharing screen, although I'm a host today, but I don't know. Okay, well, hold on for a sec. Yeah, yeah, I, I know why. Hang on. Thank you. I try it now. No, it says the same work. thing. No, still says participant screen sharing is not allowed. Hmm. Before the seminar, I did a uh, I did a practice run and I was able to access and share a screen. Are you logged in via the 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 the, the, the message that you sent me? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was able to share a screen before, so but I'm not right now. I don't I don't know. Um, anybody? Can anybody help? So last week when, or two weeks ago when we were doing it, Jerry, um, yeah. and Laurence and I found that only one of us could be logged in as the admin in order for the screen sharing to occur. So when we did it, we decided that Anne Laurence would log in through the Juno Ontario login and then I logged in as a guest. So that's probably the same situation because you have both of you logged in through the Juno Ontario login. Yeah, I, I logged think you're out. right. I'm logged so, out now, so. Well, you're still on. You're still on my screen, and it still says Juno Ontario. So I think you probably need to. But if you leave the meeting, so this is the problem now. If you leave the meeting, I think you, you might kick everybody uh, off. And... I'm I'm able to share now. I'm able to share now. Okay. We're Isn't not technology seeing technology wonderful. I, I'm I'm getting there. Okay. All right. Uh, can you see my screen now? It's a Judo Ontario, uh, Judo Ontario virtual uh, novice referee webinar. Yes. All right. Perfect. You're in business. All right. Um, again, the first uh, the first uh, screen is very obvious. Uh, tonight uh, we are going to present you the two subjects that I mentioned. But before that, uh, I was uh, jealous of uh, Alan and Archer last week when they did the presentation. Um, so I thought maybe it started with a little video, so I'm just uh, copying them. So please uh, watch, enjoy the next three, four minutes just watching a short video.
I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, you in your uh, in your screen, you see a picture of uh, Jessica. Uh, we talk about this a little bit last week session, but I thought to share some of my uh, my reasoning. Why do I referee? Which I know a lot of us referee feel the same way. So I thought to share that with you. I think one of the, the number one reason is that after most of us after our competition uh, season ends and we are old and we can't compete anymore, we decide what we and how we want to contribute back to the sport, which we absolutely love. For me, it was the coaching and then switch to refereeing. So that was uh, that's my number one reason. But being honest with you, number two, number two reason that keeps me motivated and continue doing so is people like Jessica. Uh, Judo Ontario uh, is uh, running a series of uh, talking to the champions, uh, which is every Saturday. I strongly recommend you to, to uh, watch it next Saturday. Uh, but the first uh, session was with Jessica, and Jessica was very calm in various questions were addressed to her. She described her Judo career, and uh, I'm just going to uh, sort of very briefly uh, to bring it to my point is Jessica started at four. She's 24 right now. She's been doing judo for 20 years and she has moved through the ranks of as an athlete, uh, regional, provincial, national. And uh, recently she was number one in the world for, uh, for a long time. And then now she's number two. But she was describing her career path and uh, really uh, made me think about the presentation today and uh, wanted to tell you that what motivates me every day, and I do a lot of studying. In average, I study easily an hour, an hour and a half every day, even though with the COVID. And the study being watching videos, reading my manual, and uh, basically talking to some other referees or attending seminars like this internationally or nationally. Um, and I feel a responsibility. Jessica, age of four, she starts, uh, her career and then she comes to various tournaments and people like me or people like you and various level of her career could be regional it could be provincial there's a referee in the center there are two judges in a corner that they're actually evaluating her performance that day and for us is that day we come in we check in we drop our coats off and we get our radios we start for Jessica's of the world is very crucial day. Uh, qualifier could be uh, could be uh, going to nationals or international events. I, as a referee, have a huge responsibility because she has worked hard. She she sacrifices her relationship with her schoolmates, not doing the regular thing teenagers do. She uh, invests time. She has a restrict diet. She trains hard. And what is my responsibility to just come um, show up, uh, see it in a flyer, and just go and referee now? I need to be prepared. I need to be knowledgeable. I need to do a lot of homework. Make sure when Jessica appears in front of me, whatever level, or Jessica, new Jessica, that comes in front of me, even at the provincial level, that I have the knowledge and I have the skills, or I train at least as hard as they have, and I appear on the mat to officiate and judge their judo performance. I need to have a judo knowledge. I need to have a desire. And I need to be constantly... Uh, working to improve my craft, my craft, which is a referee, as she constantly committed and puts a time and effort and commitment to be prepared. So I have a huge responsibility to be ready. The, the, the last reason that I referee is that referee is awesome. You travel all over the country or the world, whatever level you are, you meet a lot of like-minded people. They're all judokas. They're all at the stage of their life that they want to continue back as a referee. You are like-minded, you share uh, common interests and it really becomes a part of family. Truly, some we travel uh, across the world and we have friends all over the place. You can make a phone call and you land in uh, Vancouver or you land in Amsterdam and there's somebody there to greet you, pick you up. So this to me, it's, it's a huge family. So I thought to share this three reason that I, uh, that I referee. Uh, the agenda tonight is that the sorry, Mohammed. Can I just interrupt you for a sec? I, I just need to make a correction. Um, it was brought to my attention that I kind of misread the uh, the the, um, the discount uh, flyer that was sent out. Um, 
Uh, so I just re just reread it. Judo Ontario has decided to offer members who register for the 2021 season a 30% discount on Judo Ontario portion for the upcoming 2021-22 season. So it's not this year's membership. It's going to be next year's membership. All right. Um, hopefully I didn't confuse everybody, but anyway, sorry about that. Go ahead, Mohammed. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Um, contest area. Um, I'm going to uh, elaborate on it in the next slide, but I just talked briefly about it. Contest area is the area that the athletes they compete. And referee is in charge of that contest area. And uh, there's a lot of activity happens there that referees observe and basically is a sheriff in town. And he has a responsibility to, to uh, monitor everything thing goes on. And as I said, I'll elaborate on it uh, in the next slide. Gestures. Um, what is gestures? In, uh, in judo, uh, we all uh, learn to some extent some Japanese expressions or words that they have meaning, but because we do it for so long that we all know what wazari is, but, but uh, grandma, when it comes to watch little Johnny, doesn't know what wazari is. So in order to, in order to communicate with the crowd, the, 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 the event is very noisy. There are microphones, there are speakers talking. And uh, also the Josaki table who are recording what's going on, they need to also hear. So in our sport, before 1964 Olympics, they, they had the pawn and they had wazaris, they had hajimes. But uh, the, the gestures was basically to assist crowd to see what's going on because they cannot hear the referee. Also, the Josaki recognize the uh, recognize the gestures and the scorekeepers um, do whatever the referee uh, requires them to do. So that's just a brief explanation what we're getting into. Um, what you see on your screen is the contest area. Uh, we have internationally speaking, uh, the contest area is 10 meter by 10 meter. Uh, there are modification can be done that IGF allows it, uh, sometimes at the national level and provincial level, we are permitted to go eight by eight. So the contest area that you see here, and the colors can vary. For example, at Tokyo World Championships last year, 2019, sorry, they tried blue. And uh, here you see yellow. In Judo Ontario events, we have yellow. Uh, most of us, we competed uh, old days, used to be all green. So the colors change, and this color is really depends on the media's request or media's attraction. This color varies, but what you see 10 by 10 is the contest area. If you look at the two corner of the screen, which is your right and left hand in the top corners, is where the, uh, where the athletes enter, uh, right where the, where the monitor is for the scorekeeping board and the other corner that is empty. White always enters in the contest area, from the right hand side of referee. If the referee sees the blue is on uh, the other side, which means we'd be on the left, on the right side of the referee, he must not allow the contest uh, starts or the participant enter the contest. And that usually sometimes happens at the provincial or regional level, at international level, because you come out of the shoot, uh, the shoot directs you and sends the blue first uh, because it has a longer distance to travel and sends the white because the shorter distance to travel and they all experience fighters, but you have to be cognizant of that, which, um, which contestant uh, are on the white side of you as a referee in all time, not just when they enter, during the match, during the contest, every time you say Mate, you have to monitor this and trust me, it does happen. The blue goes uh, to the left, uh, to the right and white goes to the left. And you have to make sure before you say Hajime that that changes because it's not just about you, also about the scorekeeping and also the table. White is on the right. So um, the two corners before they enter to the red area, which we call a safety, which generally speaking on the uh, rules, they uh, can vary, but we like to have a four meter uh, distance between each contest area. So mat one, mat two, mat three, uh, we like to have a four meters uh, or some events is not possible. Uh, so it could be shorter. Now, when the athletes get to the corners, the judo etiquette requires for you to bow. And your bow is not only to the contest area, it's also to the josaki. 
So prior to you enter to the red, you bow or you step on the red and you bow. It depends on, on the fighter. So then you walk to the corners which they are standing as you can see in the picture and they can uh, uh, wait to referee to, uh, to uh, invite them in or they don't have to wait. They actually, they can come to the corner and they do not, I like to emphasize on this, they do not have to bow to the contest. As you can see here, white is bowing, blue is bowing. They don't have to bow, but referee's job is to ensure that both fighters get into the contest area simultaneously. White cannot walk on himself while blue hasn't even finished the red area, get to the, get the yellow, because sometimes he can walk faster or, uh, you know, rushing or running to get to the contest area. You, as a referee, your job is to ensure the two contestants they enter to the contest area simultaneously. They do not have to bow. What they have to do is when you invite them in, they can wait and you can use your both hands straight out, palm up, and you can invite them in, but they don't have to. If they decide to wait for you to invite them and it does happen, you just invite them. You do not make them to bow. They don't have to bow. They walk in and they usually, there are tapes and some international tournaments like this one, they do not have the tape. So there's no blue or red or white. There's no uh, second. They just come in the third distance, usually two to one half meters to the contestant, they just keep a certain distance. Then they have to bow. When they enter to the center of the mat, they have to bow and they make one step forward. They do not attempt a kumikata. They do not attempt to grab each other judogi. They just bow to each other and they do not have to be simultaneous. This is a misnomer. You don't have to, they don't have to. Please don't make them, hey, if they don't bow, one bows and the other one is halfway into bow. They don't have to re-bow them again. They can bow on their own timing as long as they bow. And they step one step forward and they wait. They cannot start till the referee says hajime. Referee's hajime is when the contest starts and that's when the Josaki starts the time going. And when the time, when the referee says mate, that's the job of the scorekeepers to ensure the time stops. Now, the same process that I described is on the way out. The only difference is that when the contest ends, they maintain the where they started. The referee steps one foot forward and steps in and awards the winner. And there's a couple of ways of to do that. You can walk in and just raise your right hand or left hand and just go directly up. Or some people like myself, I like to raise my arm up above my shoulder, elbow bent, and just award to the winner. Please make sure as a referee that you look at the contestant who won the match. You're extending your respect. You're showing the, I appreciate your effort. You're communicating visually by looking at the contestant. Please don't look at their forward. It's okay if you do, but it's not respectful. Just look at the fighter that who won the match, who won the match, and just award it. And then you bring your arm up, you step back, and then they bow to each other. They have to bow. They cannot refuse bowing there. They don't have to shake hands. You used to stop them from shaking hands, but internationally, they don't do that anymore. To the contrary, they like shaking hands because it's camaraderie, whatever. And then they can walk out. When they walk out, again, they do not have to contest to bow to the contest area when they are the red as they are right now. When they're leaving, you don't make them bow there. They don't have to bow. They walk out and when they get to the edge of the red where they step in, they bow. Again, as a tradition of a sport, nobody's gonna keep them there and say, oh, you didn't bow, you have to step, you have to bow there. No, they just, all judokas do that because we respect our tatami, we respect the josaki, we respect all the crowd. So we bow on the edge of the red and we walk out. Um, I forgot something to tell you. If there are any questions uh, from in my presentation, please write it down. And at the end, we will have an uh, opportunity to ask questions. It's gonna be a lot of material and to stay on time, I'd rather to uh, leave your questions at the end. Now, the fighters are in the center. A referee must face Jujosaki. I mean, that's very obvious, but 
let's talk about it. Referee must face the Josaki every single time that he or she says Hajime. It's not respectful that, that you will be uh, on this side where it says Paris 20. So we're opposite side of where the referees are standing and you're facing on the other side of the stadium and say Hajime, which means your back is to a Josaki. We don't do that. It's your job as a referee to ensure your movement is the way that no matter where the action occurs, you gently, slowly, respectfully, you walk back. You don't turn your back towards the fighters. In all time, you're responsible to visually monitoring the contest area. So if the throw happens to the opposite side where Josaki is in this picture, you say mate, the fighters are standing up and you as a referee, you step backwards to where this referee is right now. Doesn't have to be exactly where you started, but you, um, you started from there and you say Hajime. We don't wanna be our back towards Josaki. Now, one thing I apologize, I forgot because of the picture is that how referee bounce. Uh, we have different rules for different events. Sometimes the, uh, the chief referee says you enter from the right, you exit to the left. Sometimes say no, you enter to the right and you exit to the, to the right. Also all both referees, when they're switching shift, they walk from the same side, it varies. So please wait till uh, uh, the chief of referee at the beginning of the day will tell you. Now, when the referee comes, picture that there's no contestant here. The referee comes to the edge of the yellow, right on red, and he bows. Bowing is, you need to know how to bow. Uh, very important. You are representing our sport. You need to bow properly. You don't want to bend too much. You don't want to be too bent too little. You don't want to be looking forward when you bow. You don't want your hands be beside you when you're bowing. You want to bring it to the foot, bring it to above your knee. So basically a proper judo bow, very important. And then you step one step forward from the red. So you entering almost uh, just, just a slightly less than a meter. You walk in the yellow where this referee is. And please, every time you come back, come back to where you were. And the reason I do that, personally do that, is that sometimes the referees are too close to the contest contestants and he or she says Hajime. And because they're close to the fighters, fighters start their komikata and they're just already stepping on your foot or they're coming too close to you and becomes dangerous. So always stay one meter from the contest area inside. And that's the safest way to do it. That's the safest place to be in all time. And just in case if when you say Hajime and the contestant move to the left and right or come right at you, you can shift your body gently to the left to go uh, the left corner, or you can gently move to the right corner, very gently. You don't wanna have drastic uh, movements because remember, it's not about us. It's always about a contestant. So we wanna be almost invisible. What we need to do, we need to be spectators. And a good referee, and I was being told that by <clears throat> very, very experienced uh, international Olympic referee that you wanna be not gently seen. You wanna be heard, which means when there's action, just don't be on the way. It's not about us, just call the calls. So trying to your movement be as gentle as possible is not dramatic, is not drastic. Uh, your signals shouldn't be drastic or dramatic. Now, your movement, if I may talk gently and slow, small uh, comment about your movement. <clears throat> referees really move, should move based on your knowledge, especially international referees. And we have some highly uh, experienced referees here nationally and internationally. When you wanna move, you wanna move to the direction that you're anticipating the two contestants are moving. It's hard for a beginner referee, but I trust me, you will develop that. As we know as judoka, we know the movement. So if they're going to the left, so please don't go to the left, go to the right. Because obviously if you go to the same direction that they are going, you'll be on the wheel on top of you. So move your body just by turning. You don't have to necessarily all the time walk backwards. You can just turn your shoulder. You'll be seeing them when they're in a left-hand corner. You can turn your shoulder gently to the right, and you can see, again, you wanna see them. You don't have to necessarily always walk with them. Now, when the contestants are moving away from you, please move away the same direction that they're going. 
it's sometimes you see international referees also do that, which it's not right. The two contestants, if you can picture them, they're walking to the left corner towards Joseki, and the referee is still walking in the center for some reason. Well, how could you walk in the center if the throw happens in the left-hand corner? So you need to move to your left and comes to the angle that you can see the throw and the landing as much as possible. Sometimes throws are fast, moves away from you, but you need to position yourself that you can see the landing as best as possible. Of course, you have your team, you have your judges. If the action is moving away from you towards Yosaki, your team is there and you gently you look up and they will tell you what's going on, which we can get into the later seminars, how the referee and judges should communicate. But at this point is that your job as a referee, you are the boss. You are the boss of this contest. You are the person in charge. You need to see in all time what happens. So back to my point, if the two contestants after Kumikata, they're moving towards Josaki to the left, there's no point for you moving to the center because if throw happens to the left corner, you will not see him. And also when, when the Kumikata is going on as most referees know, and we get into that again in future, that a lot of action or lack of action happens with the upper body, which our sport requires of with the kumikata. For example, if it's a pistol grip, if it's a cross grip, if it's a belt is holding, it's mostly happened to our upper body. So you always want to be in an angle that you can visibly and comfortably observe upper body of the fighters, which means on an angle. You don't want to be the, between the two fighters behind them while they have a kumikata. You want to be always in a position that you can see their kumikata. And if there's an infringement occurs and there's a penalty need to be given, you have seen it. You don't want to just, you know, guess, oh, I think it was a pistol grip. So let's mate and stop them because your judges and video supervisor and said, no, that wasn't a pistol grip. So always please position yourself where you can see what's going on with the kumikata. Whatever the angle you are, if you have to turn your body, do, but don't go behind the fighters. Don't follow them straight because sometimes they turn and the kumikata can change and they can be a simply becomes a grabbing the belt or grabbing the bottom of the jacket. And if you don't see that, you are putting the uke in a disadvantage because you are behind, you didn't see the kumikata, the action occurs by grabbing the blow the belt. Uh, and because you're positioning yourself, that's a disadvantage um, to, uh, to uke because there's infringement occurs. So generally speaking, there are two, um, uh, there are two uh, scoreboards or score monitors, they call them because electronics now, one behind you and one is in front of you. And the reason they do that, not only is for the spectators, also for Josaki, also forward for the uh, for the judges. Also, you could be turn around. You could be moving, and you need to be able to see the scoreboard. If now you're facing the opposite of where this referee is standing, if the action happens on that side, you need to monitor the scoreboard. The scoreboard is fully responsibility of the referee. The referee is 100% responsible for everything that happens in the mat. We call the center referee. Center referee needs to ensure when there's a wazari or penalty given, the scoreboard reflects on that. If there's a mate announced and the timekeepers are not pressing the button to stop the time and time is going, it's your responsibility. But in reality, there's a lot of actions are going, it's going on there. Your primary job is to ensure that the fighters are doing what they're supposed to do and they do a clean judo and you need to be uh, uh, you need to be cognizant of what happens to announce or make your call. Also, um, sometimes your angle could be wrong, uh, but you're not seeing this uh, scoreboard. You're paying attention to Nawaza action, but in all time, you need to pay attention momentary look. At the same time, you got two judges. So the judge is not just uh, scot free here. You need to make sure when the referee raises arms for Wazari, immediately the judge's responsibility, both of their responsibility, is to look at a scoreboard to make sure the score goes uh, on the board first and make sure it's on the right side. What I mean by that is if the referee thinks the throw was Wazari for white, the score has to go on the board Wazari for white. Sometimes the scorekeepers are not experienced 
sometimes they get caught in the action or sometimes they press the wrong button. And I've seen internationally too, and these are trained people, but a, a mistake happens. But the judge's responsibilities immediately after any gesture by referee of penalty or mate or a score is their responsibility to ensure they look up and make sure the right, uh, uh, right score or right penalty has indicated to a right person. Now, what happens if there is a wrong score on the board? Uh, if the referee sees it before he see he or she says Hajime, needs to indicate to the scoreboard by his signals. For example, show the wazari and point to the white, just in case if they have put the wazari for blue. If the actions are very fast and there's a wazari has occurred on the map and the white gets the wazari, but the action continues to the wazari. The last thing anybody wants to referee center keeps, takes his eye or his, uh, her eye off the contestant and look at the scoreboard because while they're going down, as soon as they land, could be a choke, could be arm lock. So you want to constantly look at the action, but the judges can see that. And the judges have the ability by microphone or by radio to communicate to the referee to change the call. And his or he, her ear would say, okay, was that a white? Of course, says, was that a blue? Very short comment, very short command. Under no circumstances, anybody Anybody is allowed to change the score on the board except referee. Judges cannot demand or request from the scorekeepers to change it because they could also be wrong. But technically speaking, is the referee's responsibility, the center referee, to change the call if he's wrong on the board. <clears throat> Sometimes um, the scorekeepers, they notice themselves as soon as they put a white wasari, they say, oh, wasn't white, was blue. They can change it, that's not a problem. But if they put the board, the score on the board or penalty on the wrong side and they're not paying attention, it's not the job, job of the judges to correct it. It's the job of the judges to communicate to referee center and the center would request uh, uh, the, uh, the scorekeepers to change. Or in some cases, the time he has called Mate and the time has, did not stop and 10 seconds later the time is still going so all the communication basically i'm trying to say is that with the josaki is the responsibility of the center referees all communication oh um based on my uh uh my uh portion of uh, the agenda i think i have covered certain things that i wanted to cover as far as the contest area is concerned uh, we can get to much more details, the action where it happens, what is the stepping out when you're out of the contest area. But these are really become a, a technical uh, point of view, which committee will have seminars in future to focus on more in details of uh, contest area and the activity and the actions by Tori and OK. Mm -hmm. Not the contest area, but presently, that's all I want to discuss a contest area and the movement of referee and uh, how he or she needs to conduct himself in the contest area. It's gonna grab a glass of water. All right. Um, gestures. As I said earlier, needs to be hand communication when you are gesturing. Definition of a gesture is that. But sometimes, which we get to it later, sometimes you have to use your feet, foot. As a as a, as a as a as a uh, as a center judge, so I just want to put this a slide in and talk about it. it's not always hand, uh, which we uh, get into the gestures. You see, almost ninety nine percent of the gestures are hand gestures, and that's how referee communicates his opinion or her opinion to the to Josaki. But sometimes there are a couple of uh, uh, situations that you you actually use your foot to to uh, communicate, but primarily is your hand movement. So oh, one thing as far as the contest area is concerned, uh, by the way, you're looking at an Olympic champion, uh, a Olympic referee going to uh, uh, 2021, hopefully in uh, Tokyo. She's from Korea, uh, gold medal Olympian, I think is 1996 Atlanta, fantastic referee. 
She was number one for uh, many years and she's one of our good colleagues, great referee. Um, now, the gesture that she's showing, uh, it relates to the contest area. In international events, it doesn't usually happen in a regional or provincial tournament because the contestants walk in on the mat themselves. At the national level and international level, the contestant has to wait on the edge because Josaki has to be prepared. Josaki sometimes have to correct the scoreboard or make it zero, or there's technical issues with the video cameras or in a very high level events, uh, for example, uh, Grand Slam Grand Prix, uh, day one, uh, there's one mat area and the contestant have to wait, wait to be invited. So the gesture that you see, you can picture if you may, these, uh, they are both standing on their uh, perspective corners before the inter to the red, as you can see behind the referee. White is on the right hand side of the referee. Blue is on the left hand side of the referee and they're waiting. Now, Josaki uh, shows his or her readiness who is running the Josaki by shaking their head and say, I'm ready. Or they just verbalize, I'm ready. And then referee gestures by standing his, his or her arm both outside and moving their hands forward is like a wave. You're just basically asking them to enter. So that's the gesture for when the fighters are in a corner and waiting for the contest actually starts or being invited to the contest before the contest starts. Actually, that's better. The next gesture. Oh, don't we all, uh, anybody who competes in judo, uh, they know they love to see this, uh, this gesture, that's for sure, from the referee. Now, please uh, pay attention, a couple of things, uh, referee's uniform. Uh, I want to mention that in this uh, picture. The size of referee uniform that you wear is very crucial. Uh, if you want a referee, of course, we have novice events for uh, younger or less experienced referees, which we would allow them wear just a shirt or old days we used to let them wear a golf shirt. Uh, but this is a referee uniform. It's a gray pants. Uh, it's a uh, black uh, blazer, uh, international refer referee, level referees, they wear blue ties and a white shirt and must. And in international level referees, our national level referees, they have their badge, which is on the left hand side of the jacket. And that indicates their rank and which indicates their experience uh, as far as the number of uh, years that they have been refereeing. So having a proper judo uniform as a referee is crucial because a lot of hand gestures and have movements, if your clothing doesn't fit you well, would actually will not look attractive. And a lot of judo events now, they are uh, recorded, uh, they will put on their YouTube. So please, if you want a referee and you have to wear a uniform because the level of referee you are, please wear a uniform that you fits you because some of the gestures actually cause the jacket buttons to pop out and I've seen it international event. She or he go, actually it was he, he goes, was that he extend the arms out and then boom, they, uh, the button pops out <laughs> and he had to uh, not to say a uh, man walk over there and, uh, and pick up uh, his button. So uh, proper uniform is wearing plan. Back to your point. Uh, we don't want to get what a pawn means because we will in the future and the ladies uh, and Lawrence and uh, Arta Conley, there's a seminar, they told us what Ippon was, but we get into it more in details later. But the referee's right hand uh, or left hand, please, as a referee, it's crucial that if you can't practice to use both of your arms, it's not easy, trust me. I've tried it for a long time. I'm getting better and better at it, but try to use both of your arms because there are some circumstances that you actually need to use both of your arms. So you better practice. So in order to announce a pawn, you need to raise your right arm or a left arm and you bring it up and your palm is facing the Josaki and your arm is a straight up. Some of us old fighters, uh, there are a lot of in elbow injuries or shoulder injuries and we cannot actually raise our arms straight up. So it bends a little bit or maybe our shoulder and elbows are deformed, doesn't look straight but bring it right against your face and making sure your arm, your, your bicep, tricep, it rubs against your ear. It has to be that is straight up. And uh, um, very clear, I don't need to discuss more. And make sure your left hand is always where is 
her hand. In all time, your both hands should be beside you is judo etiquette. When we walk, when we bow, our arms are always beside us. And in this case, she forces her left arm against her body while she's raising her arm. Your feet, your feet are very important. Uh, in your movement, you walk around on a, uh, uh, your feet should be not wider than your shoulders, natural walk. And when you want give any gesture, your feet should be together, except in a situation that is all psychomy, or you have to use your feet to show a gesture. But generally speaking, in this case, you can see her feet are very nicely together, toes apart, which basically is a proper judo stand. The next gesture is wazari. Um, please pay attention to this picture. It happens very, very regularly. I seen it in a provincial, uh, regional, national, international level. What my good friend, Hungarian referee shows here is that your arm is straight up parallel to the ground. Wazari, your arm should never go above your shoulder. You have to maintain that parallel position with the tatami. So don't raise your old days. We used to bring our arm up uh, halfway between a, what he has and the phone. And some people are still doing that. It's not acceptable. If you go for examination, national level, international level, you do that, that's a uh, mark against you. Uh, your fingers in all time, I forgot about that. Your fingers in all time should be closed. Don't keep your fingers open when you're doing gestures like Pon Wazari or any other uh, gestures you want, trying to keep your fingers as close to each other as possible. I would have preferred personally keep his uh, feet apart, but he's probably watching in an action and he's, he's gonna probably move. And that's why he doesn't have his feet together. And it's, it's sometimes hard for Wazari, but that's where the Wazari signal uh, happened. One thing about uh, your uh, gestures and your awarding a uh, Wazari or Ipon, please, as soon as you make the call, even for penalties, please, before you continue, a hajime or whatever the case is, just have a glance at the scoreboard. And that's a very, very good practice. Ensures that if there is a, uh, a score that you have called gone to a wrong side or a penalty gone to a wrong side before you say hajime, because as soon as you say hajime, you are uh, distracted again. Their action is going on. You need to be pay attention. So when you call a wazari, quickly in the corner of your eye, just look at the scoreboard that is in front of you and making sure it's gone to uh, the, the correct side. It's a very, very good practice. Next gesture, very commonly done incorrectly, uh, which is a wazari avasate pon. When does wazari avasate pon occurs is when there's a wazari already on the board for blue or white, and the same con contestant scores another wazari, which is a wazari, wazari avasate pon. Now, how do we do this signal? Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, situation happens that the referee from the wazari raise their arm all the way up from number one and come to picture number three, that it's incorrect. If you're going for examination, it would be marked against you. When you show your wazari, and is a case of avasate pon, your arm comes back down, comes out beside you, which is a picture two, and then from the down position comes back up ipon. Like imagine if there was no wazari and was just a straight ipon, from a picture two you go straight up. So you must, for a wazari avasate pon, after showing a proper wazari in picture one, you need to bring your arm all the way down beside you and bring it back up to the pawn. That's a wazari of the day pawn. Next one is osaikomi. Uh, there is a action uh, in the waza and uh, there is a hold down that referee needs to call osaikomi. Uh, again, when is osaikomi? We get into that in the technical seminars in the future, but let's say if you already know is a osaikomi, what the referee needs to do he or she needs to step forward with their right foot and without bending too much. We don't bend actually internationally, they don't even bend anymore. You just bring your right arm out and you hold. And that's a gesture for us at Komi. Please don't bend. You don't need to bend at all. Just maybe a slightly move your shoulder forward 
So you're not bending your back, you're not bending your upper body, it's just your arms move forward and just a slightly lean forward, very slightly. And that full side call me. How long would you hold it? Uh, any of the signals for a, for a command, usually hold it maybe a second of two, maybe for Osaikomi, hold it three seconds to make sure that if the Josaki was distracted, they'll see you uh, in a timely uh, manner that you have called Osaikomi. So bring your arm out, hold it, maybe in your head call, count one, two, and bring your arm beside you and continue your observation uh, that what's going on on the map. The next one, Osaikomi was called and the referee notices that Osaikomi no longer valid. Uh, Uke has come out of the Osaikomi and he has to lean forward again with the same right foot and move his or her hand from the left to the right only a couple of times, not three, four, five times, just one or two times is sufficient. As you can see, he leans a little bit again forward. He's not leaning a lot forward. The same amount that he leaned forward for Osaikomi, he leans forward and he just waves his hand. And uh, that's basically a signal uh, for, uh, for uh, Paketa. The next one, Mate. Uh, there are situations that the time needs to stop, uh, various, various uh, reasons, which again, in future, we can get into it. For example, uh, there's a wazari happen and gone to Osaikomi and Uke has come out and there's no more action. There's no continued movement on the ground and referee, he or she says, mate. So you bring your arm out. Again, your arms very similar to wazari is a straight out, shoulders parallel to the ground and your fingers are closed and your palm of your hand, you have bended your wrist and you indicating stop the time. Now again, hold it for one or two seconds and bring it down. Again, please try to use both hands. If you are a right hand normally, practice with the left hand shows with the left. It doesn't matter at all. There's no obligation for you to do both arms, but it's helpful. And you see in future that is very helpful if you can use both of your arms. That's a mat tape. The next one, Sona Mama. Um, honestly, uh, I cannot recall when was the last time I saw Sona Mama internationally. Uh, it does not happen. Even nationally, very rarely happen. Usually, uh, again, I don't want to get too much why we call Sona Mama. It's more about a gesture, but there is some infraction it occurred while there's a sacomi or uh, there's a bleeding is going on or uh, there's some kind of a confusion. So you call Sona Mama. The way you call Sona Mama, you put your hand, right or left hand, uh, on each contestant, as the uh, picture shows, and you call Yoshi. So then whatever the situation was is resolved. And if you have to put them back exactly what you found them, or they remain the same position, they're just a Sona Mama was called. Again, you put your hand, both uh, of the contestant, and you announce the same call, and they... Uh, the contest continues. Next gesture. Uh, you see this very, very often internationally, especially when the golden score, uh, the, uh, the fighters are getting tired. Uh, there's a lack of interest or enthusiasm, if I can use that word, to come back to the center of the contest area. And they want to remain on the ground. They're just dragging their feet. They want to catch their breath. Uh, they're taking their time fixing their jacket while they're still in the ground instead of getting up, coming to the center to fix their geese. These are the two signals that you can use and they're both acceptable. You can use uh, as uh, a female referee in the case here with two hands, uh, which doesn't usually happen, but you can. Um, usually a, a gentler gesture is what our female colleague is doing, a male colleague is doing by just uh, extending your arm out your palm is facing up in both cases and you're indicating by bouncing your palm upwards that please get up. That's a gesture for if they're taking the time to get up and come back to the center. Okay, uh, I hope this doesn't happen to uh, none of us, but it does happen, trust me. Uh, you have called the Wazari 
um, and uh, your uh, your uh, judges uh, do not agree with you, both of them. They think there was no call, or they both think it was an Nippon, or the supervisor has reviewed the video, and you have called the Wazari, uh, or Nippon, but in this case, it was a Wazari that she's uh, using expression, waving it off. So she shows the Wazari. So let's say you call the Wazari, and then the action is going on. You have brought your arms down, and you hear in your ear by supervisor or by your colleagues, uh, no score, or they say, uh, Ipon, which you call the Wazari. So before you do anything, you have to show the signal that you have the call for. So if you call the Wazari, you have to bring your arm to the position of Wazari and use the other arm above your head. And you just, as the picture two number shows, that you have to move your arm to the left and the right. It's not just bringing it up. It's obviously the picture cannot show motion, but your the left arm of this referee has to go to the left, to the right and left of, above his head, which is an indication of that call needs to be canceled. Now, uh, uh, if the call needed to be canceled and from Wazari is going to Ipon, both arm has to come up and the arm that you use normally for scoring goes back up as an Ipon. You cannot keep one arm up or both arm ups and just go straight to a pawn. It would be a very funny picture. So you cancel the call. And if there was a Wazari to nothing, you don't have to do anything. You continue the contest. And if it was the case of Wazari called, you have waved it off and it has to go to a pawn, then you indicate a pawn that which we already have seen the picture. Uh, we, I discussed it, T1, at the beginning uh, in the contest area. It's basically awarding uh, who the winner is. In this case, some Europeans, they do it. She doesn't, but the picture is taken when she already had straightened the arm. Europeans, uh, they come forward with the right foot and they just straight raise their arm from beside them and bring up the air. That's all they do. If it's a left, uh, if it's a uh, blue side, blue uh, is the winner, they step forward, raise their right, left arm. And if it's a white, they raise their right arm. Um, I personally been taught and uh, some referees do it differently. They walk forward, they raise their arm, the elbow is bent above their shoulder and they stand, extend their arms as this referee shows to uh, uh, indicate who the winner is. All right, there's a penalty given and you have to indicate who the penalty uh, goes to. Um, we get to the gesture for penalties. And uh, one thing that I can uh, I can recommend, which I'm sure this colleague of mine will do it normally, but this is a sort of a uh, pictures taken for the book and she is not looking at the contestant. Every time you want to give a penalty, please do look at the contestant. It's very important for them to know and you for them to indicate to them, hey, I'm looking at you. You're the one getting the shido is respectful, is very directive. And uh, by just pointing your fingers and looking Josaki is not a good manner for referee. So uh, raise your arm uh, with your finger as she's showing you point at either, uh, uh, in this case, obviously blue is getting it. If it was a, if it was a white is getting it, she will raise her right arm and use the same finger to, uh, to indicate who it is. Okay, uh, non-combativity. Again, I'm repeating myself some of these uh, 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 slides, please excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> there are technical reason that Uke or Tori, in this case, we can see from the picture is a, is a white, uh, it's getting a penalty uh, because the direction she's looking at. As I said earlier, when you give a penalty, look at the contestant you're giving and she's doing it here. Um, the, uh, the gesture for this one is, as you can see, she has uh, bent her elbow, brought both her arm to her chest level. And what she's going to do, she's going to move in action, bring her right hand over her left and just use a signal to show uh, the non-combativity. Now, sometimes you see some referees, they do this movement five, six, seven times before the stop. You don't really need to do that. All you have to do, just turn your hand twice. All you have to do, maybe three times max. 
you don't really need to don't need to do that circular motion with your hands five six seven times and doesn't have to be a fast speed it actually has to be calm it has to be very gentle very gentle move your arms over each other and indicate who is getting on combat activity now there are cases that um, the both contestants are getting non-combativity. So you turn towards the person who decide you decide to give to first. Uh, you do as gesture she's doing, and then you turn your shoulder back. You face the other contestant, and you give the same signal. Now, what I do is that because I want to practice both of my arms, when I want to give a uh, non-combativity to a uh, to a uh, white. I keep my right hand above my left. So when I move, when I start my moving, moving uh, arm action, I have my right hand over my left and I do a circular motion twice. So after the second time, my left hand comes beside me and my right hand is already ready to go to the white. And if I want to give it to the left contestant, which is blue, I keep my left hand above my right and do the same motion. So by the time I've done two, my right hand comes beside me and my left hand points at the, at the, uh, at the uh, blue contestant for getting it. So it's a little bit of trick. Sometimes you go so many times and then bring both hands in, and you bring your arm up. Less movement, remember, it's not about us, it's about the contestant. So love hand, your right hand more if you want to give it to the white. Left hand is, it takes practice like everything else. That's what I, it has worked for me. The next gesture, false attack. Um, we don't want to get into definition, but I tell you false attack is any attack that is not a good attack, is, is not a real attack, uh, lacks uh, judo requirements, uh, position, for example. But anyways, without getting into the technicality of it, false attack, the uh, referee brings both of her arms in front of her, uh, make a fist with both hands, and just gently as picture, Two and three shows, she just lowers her hand. And as you can see in this picture, again, she wants to give it to the white. For some reason, white is being a bad contestant, getting all the penalties. But uh, this turn, she turns towards the contestant who she wants to give a false attack to. She brings both of her arms, extended the straight arms in front of her, and then make a fist. And she lowers her arm, doesn't have to bring all the way down in front of her, just bring it slightly down. Your, if you want to give in this case to the white, your left hand goes beside you, and your right hand, as we showed in a slide prior, uh, slide prior, you show with your finger who the penalty goes to. So your left hand, in this case, has to come down in the relaxed position, and then your right hand makes a finger, and you point at the contestant by looking at it and giving a false attack. The next one, it's called doctors. Now, this is an old picture. Unless it's a very, very severe injury, we do not invite the, uh, invite the doctors to the mat area anymore. We actually send the contestant outside and one of the judges who actually, correct myself before I've been saying it, no longer judges also get up. Uh, some off the UD judge comes to the, or official, maybe supervisor, mat supervisor, but usually another referee who is off duty. Uh, he comes to the side of the mat and uh, attends to the blood uh, cases usually on the side of the mat. But if the doctor needs to be or medical personnel need to be invited because the injury was severe, they cannot just walk on the mat themselves. Nobody is allowed to come in a contest area while the contest is going on without an invitation of a referee. So as you can see, you extend your right or left hand, doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be left or right, you can do either. And you sometimes, uh, th this is a case that medical staff already on the side of the mat, you call them in. If there are no medical staff on the side of the mat, you have to gesture or by asking your judges or your judges will call medical staff from different part of the contest area, well, stadium area to come to your mat. And they do not enter until you provide this gesture, which you're officially inviting medical personnel uh, on the mat area. Okay, blocking. Again, I don't want to get into technicality what blocking is. Blocking is when a contestant is preventing a skillfully and intentionally to prevent other contestant to do his or her judo. So 
this blocking can happen two ways. You can block someone with two hands, stretch arms and keep them away from you, or be with one hand. If it happened with two hands, you as a referee have a responsibility to show blocking attitude with two hands, which in this case, uh, our friend, uh, left or right hand doesn't matter, or leg doesn't matter, usually is standing up, again, facing the contestant who done, does the uh, infraction, and you make your fist, you straight your arm, and you turn your wrist. You can see the turning your wrist part in this picture, but you have to show, because we have a similar signal, a little bit upper arm, when we have straight arms and a stretch arm, so you have to bring it down uh, a little bit level that he has, maybe even lower, and twist your wrist shows you're actually blocking. Twist your wrist inside, outside, downward, doesn't matter, but you need to show an action of twisting your wrist to show two hand blocking. The next slide, show a one hand blocking, which again, as I said, if the contestant is preventing the other contestant to enter uh, by straining the arm or blocking and you stand one arm out and the same thing, you turn your wrist by showing a twist that it's a blocking action. Again, after showing that signal, your hand stays up and you make a point finger. You don't bring your hands back down again and bring your hand up again. So you show the infraction and then you make a fist as it is already and you extend your finger and you point out and looking at the contestant. That's the, that's the experienced way of doing it to the contestant who is receiving the penalty. The next one, uh, cross grip. Uh, cross grip uh, is that when both of your hands are on one the same side of the body. So if you divide the body for half, you cannot, in the judo rules, that you cannot have both of your hands on the same side of the body of uke without immediately attacking. Again, I'm I'm getting to too much technicality, but I have to in this case. So if both of your hands on one side of the judo gi and one side of the body of the uke and you are not attacking, and uh, that's called a cross grip. You can get that grip and attack immediately, which again, it's an explanation on its own. And then uh, you get this penalty. Uh, the referee has to say mate. Um, in some cases, while they're walking to the middle, some cases, not in this case, you bring him to the middle, you show the signal, again, turn your body towards the contestant who's receiving the penalty, and then you show the signal, you bring the hands that is not giving the finger uh, uh, to uh, the contestant by pointing at him or her to receive the penalty, and you open your fist and your finger, and you just uh, indicate to the contestant uh, that penalty that she's getting. Again, uh, please pay attention before the say hajime in this case, uh, just look at the scoreboard, like in the other penalty, make sure the scoreboard reflects on what you have uh, given. Hopefully your judges agree with you, nothing changes, but uh, but uh, that's the signal. Now, actually, I just reminded myself, as I showed you in a prior slide, if you have to change the call for Wazari or Ipon, I'll show you the signal. In this case, any penalty is given to a contestant after referee said Mate and given the penalty and some reason the judges don't agree with the penalty or the supervisor have requested them to cancel that penalty, you must show the penalty again by to not indicating the actual signal. You don't need to do that anymore. You just do your extension of your finger and just wave it off. For example, in this case, is a cross grip and the judges have directed you to cancel the cross grip. You don't bring your arm and show the cross grip as we did for Wazari and then wave it off. We don't do that anymore. You just do the last part of the penalty, which is pointing at the contestant. And then you bring your other arm, as I showed earlier with the Wazari, you just wave it off. So that's the way to proper way to waving off any penalty that has been given by the center and was not approved by the judges or by the supervisor. Now, there are cases you have seen judo matches, you see the uh, the contestant is refusing to get their uh, uh, the lapel by holding it. 
and they actually hold their hand over uh, the side that Tori is trying to get the kumikata. You say, Mate, immediately if this happens a couple of times or two, three times, or is it consi con consistently occurs, you stop it and you turn towards the contestant who is doing it. You put your hand on your chest and use the opposite hand to, uh, to give a signal of penalty. Okay, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the penalty stepping out. Um, there's actually, again, we're getting to technicality, I don't want to, but uh, there's actually a stepping out and this is playing the edge, which we call it, but just for our, this gesture seminar, please don't um, confuse yourself. It's not always this a stepping out. There's not a, there's another signal for it, but it's not shown as often anymore. So what you do is you extend your arm. Some of you guys have uh, a referee to force almost at a yuko. You extend your arm out as the picture two shows and your palm is facing down on the mat and you just go to the left and right. You don't uh, bring your arm up anymore to the wazari level. You bring your shoulder down, your arm down and you just move your arm to the left and right. And then with the opposite hand, you give a gesture of the penalty who pointing at to. Oh, so you don't, you don't, in this case, it's not good to wave with the arm and then finger the same on some referees do it, but internationally speaking, use your left arm, you extend if you want to give it to the right and use your right signal when you want to go to the left is more. It's sort of technicality is nothing wrong with it. You can, you can raise your arm as he has in this case and point out after penalty, but it's not really done in a higher level tournament. And they're both correct, nothing wrong with it. Okay, a pistol grip. Uh, picture two, it's very clear what pistol grip is. And uh, it's preventing uh, one contestant to be able to do judo. And uh, the signal as you see exactly as that, you grab in front of your own jacket, you make a uh, pistol grip and then with the opposite hand you give a penalty so if you're giving to the right make a pistol grip to the right arm and bring your left arm down and point with the right hand and the opposite for the left um, the next finger the next uh, the next uh, uh, sign here is fingers are inside the jacket this situation uh, happens in Tachiwaza and your fingers is not a grip is actually an infraction pistol grip is actually a grip um you don't penalize it right away as soon as you see it again i'm getting to technicality but in this case as soon as you see the fingers going inside the jacket he or she the tori is not allowed to continue you say mate and you give a penalty immediately which pistol grip if you see it if it's an immediate attack it's okay it's acceptable acceptable to make kata. in this case this is not this is infraction and immediately as soon as you see it again if you give it to the right finger of left hand goes inside and you point out with the right and opposite side you do opposite way okay not taking a grip um, <laughs> contestant skillfully refuse to engage in a kumikata that's definition of it basically and uh you raise your arm, as you can see, you do your right and left hand, the palms up, and you move them to the front and back. So the motion of the hand is not left and right, like waving is actually in and out. So you bring both palm up and you're facing the contestant who's receiving the penalty. You do the signal and you point out the penalty. The next one, leg grab. Um, as you can see, the referee has a step forward with the right foot. And in this case, she's definitely giving to the right side. If she was giving to the left, she would do the opposite. She would step forward with the left and signal with the left arm and point out with the left hand towards the uh, contestant, which is a blue in this case, where they get a penalty. In this case, she's giving a penalty to the white. She, she stepped forward with the right foot 
bends a little bit forward, which is indication of grabbing the leg and shows with her fingers bent in. That's sort of a trying to grab. And then she raises her body up and gives a, uh, gives a penalty to contestant. The next signal, it, uh, it, uh, it happens more often internationally and nationally now because as a referee, you're no longer permitted to say hajime unless the contestant are fully dressed as the judo etiquette requires, which means both of the jackets are inside your belt. Uh, even if the middle of the contest, there's a mate and they're walking to the center, it's their responsibility to fix their judo gi. And in case if they have forgotten, because this is a sort of a new rule, all days we would bring them to the center and say hajime, now the fighters are actually have to relearn that and pay attention that you will not call uh, hajime till the gi is fixed. Now in this case, the contestant obviously either forgot uh, mostly forgot. Sometimes they, 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 they pay attention or not pay attention, uh, whatever the case is, hasn't fixed the gi. So she turns toward the contestant. She crosses her arm over by extending her arms in front of her and just indicates fix your good judo gi. The next slide shows the same situation that <clears throat> no longer it will tolerate. So for example, if the first time they're coming to the center, and you had show the last slide, which is here. The next time after Mate, they come into the center, you do not have to ask them to fix the gi anymore. You actually get a shido for not fixing the judo gi because you have already given them benefit of the doubt and you, have war you warn them once. So in this case, she has turned towards the contestant. She's pointing out her belt. And then while he's fixing his gi, she can actually give, her, give him a shido. And this is the picture two is in that case. But picture one here, just gently reminding him, hey, you forgot to fix yourself up. And the picture number two is she at it. She's pointing out at the, at the belt. As you can see, she's pointing out the belt because that's where the gi is supposed to go in. And uh, he, uh, he has to fix the gi. While he's fixing gi, she raised her arm up and she points out a shido. She's allowed to do that. Actually, she's supposed to do that. Now, there are in the manual, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, infraction and gestures that is not in the book and I couldn't find a picture. So I decided to uh, just show the slide and describe what these penalties are. And they all get the shido uh, for the first time. Uh, cat paw grip, which we call it, is that when the tori grabs uh, the gi part over the wrist or on the wrist, usually happen over the wrist, and holds the gi inside of his own fist. So he grabs the gi, if you can picture it, pulls it in, turns his or her finger in, and it's called a cat paw. And cat, cat paw. So the signal exactly as such, the referee. Uh, brings her warm arm out, she shows her judo gi, her uh, jacket, and she saw a cat out, and she gives a shido person who's getting it. Okay. If a, there are ashiwaza technique in judo, which is correct, which can be done either as a direct technique or it can be as a combination technique, what you're allowed to do to pretend you're doing a society and you just bruise the ankle of your fellow competitor, which means by kicking and kicking, kicking. What the referee would do, bring him to the center and he or she put her leg out facing the contestant is doing that. She raises her foot off the mat and shows a sort of a ashiwaza, like a society action that you have kicked and she or he would give a shido to the person. Finger locking. And actually I just remember I'm adding a uh, wrist grabbing too. Finger locking is that when the contestant, they, they go up to get their grip and their fingers meet each other and they stay locked. Finger locking each other, not their own hands, obviously, each other fingers. Now there's one trying to get out and actually get a proper kumikata and the other one is not allowing this action to happen. And uh, 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 so you basically show the finger locking 
and uh, whomever you presume. It's a very technical uh, penalty, so please pay attention, making sure that if you're giving a finger locking penalty, you understand who is the one refusing the release. One is always trying to release, sometimes, and when in the case of penalty, one wants to leave the lock and one is holding it and keep pulling it towards him. And you basically stop and the person who is trying to maintain the lock, you give a penalty to them. The last one is the grabbing your wrist. In judo, we are not allowed to grab a wrist and walk around with it. So if you have, if you can picture it, you have a, uh, you have a kumikata on a lapel and the other hand that you're fighting for, uh, for a sleeve, you get the wrist of the uke uh, and you're holding it. You're not doing anything with it and you're not doing anything with it yourself and you're not letting the, uh, your, uh, your fellow competitor to do anything either. So you're just holding it. And basically you stop Mate in the center, you grab your own wrist and you show a signal that you're holding your wrist and you award the penalty. Okay, I think, uh, well, I know I've got to the uh, end of my uh, gestures. Um, there are many questionable gestures that some referees become creative, but that is not in our manual. It does happen. And us experience some of the experienced referees when you travel, you see it. Uh, I've never seen it, or they're doing it differently in various jurisdictions. Uh, in Europe, they sometimes they do some signals differently than what we do, not substantially, but slightly. So, which is not in the manual. I kept my focus on the manual, even though the three, four that I show, I show at the last slide, it's not in the manual, but it does happen very regularly. And I thought it was important enough to, uh, to mention it to you. So uh, the floor is uh, open now. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, uh, ask. And I gladly, as much as I can, I can answer it if my knowledge would allow. And if it's not, there are other um, committee members are here. She, they can assist me in to answering your questions. Please feel free. I think there's um, a question in the chat from uh, Blair. Is there a gesture for, for a penalty using your knee to break a get grip? Uh, it is, but it, it, you don't show it as, as if you can. But it's a very technical question. Thank you for asking it, Claire, by the way. Uh, if you can picture it, Claire, you don't bring your knee up and, and, and shows it. And again, he's not in the book. Um, no, you just show the, you give the penalty. You don't bring your knee up and show the action or actually slapping the wrist or breaking grip with two hands. It's not in the book, but these are some of the gestures, as I said, you uh, don't see in the book, but it does happen in the tournament, but they're not very common. For example, bring your grip with two hands. Uh, it's also, there's a signal for it. We created it, referees internationally and nationally we do it, but it's not really an official signal for it. So answering your question, no, it's not. Um, just give a shit out. And I think everybody would understand. Any other questions? Jerry, would you please uh, manage that for me and I can answer it if I can. Yeah, there's no more. I don't I don't have any more chat, but I do have a couple of questions. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, a couple of years ago, there was rumor that they were trying to change the protocol. Um, so that when you're giving a, a score to white, you use your right arm. And if you're giving a score to blue, you use your left arm. And that was going to be um, incorporated into um, scoring or into the gestures. Have you heard anything about that or is, is that just not followed anymore? Thank you for asking that question. That there was a discussion uh, it basically remained as a discussion at one of the seminars we were in Rittersal, uh, Austria, and the answer to that question was that it's uh, common sense. We don't need to put everything in the book. So basically, the answer is yes, if you want to give, and I, and I think I emphasized on it uh, in my presentation, if you want to award any kind of a penalty or award, use the hand that is facing that contestant. So if you want to give a wazari to white, bring your arm, right arm, and show Wazari 
that's what I have been practicing and I'm not very good at it. I'm, I'm trying. And if you want to give a wasari to the left, bring your left arm, which is helpful to the contestant. It's helpful to Josaki, helpful to the spectators. But it basically has become a norm internationally speaking and nationally too. I know you do it yourself. And uh, so it's not a gesture for it, no. And it's not a conversation. It doesn't come to the root book. It just has accepted and been practiced everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been trying that too. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a really bad, it's a really difficult habit to break using your same arm all the time. So uh, I've been working on that as well. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Brown asks, uh, what about the quarter turn when signaling? Is that still a thing? Uh, Thank you, Chris, for asking that question. It's not a requirement anymore, but as I said at my uh, contest area uh, presentation, part of my presentation was that every time you signal, you have to make sure it goes uh, uh, to the scoreboard. And that basically indicates that Josaki have seen it. So if you feel that your direction uh, of uh, the signal, let's, 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 let's do, actually use example. Uh, the throw has happened. Uh, on the uh, opposite side of Josaki, your back is towards uh, the Josaki, and uh, because you want to pay attention to the action, and you show up the wasari, so your back is towards them. They don't see it. But again, back to Jerry's question. Also, if you use arms to present a score, if you raise your left arm when it's a score by blue, the Josaki would see but. A very good practice is Chris, and I do it, and I know you do it too. You turn a quarter turn for them to be, for you able to be seen. But if that means that you will be taking eye, eyes off the contestant or you're not focusing the contestant, they are more important. You can always wait. If Joseki hasn't seen it and the score hasn't been recorded, when you say Mate on the way to the center, you remember what you call. And if there's no scoreboard indicating that, you show your signal then, and then show it to the fighter who got it. But you don't have to turn a quarter turn, no. All right. Um, in uh, Quebec, when they do false attack, their gesture is slightly different. They make a, like a square and then pull down. Yes, that is wrong. So, so as, as you were commenting before, it's just a different gesture that they use in Quebec, but it means the same thing. Uh, I got a question. Oops, sorry, went away. Um, Question from uh, Lo uh, Lloyd Simak. Simak? Sorry, if I'm mispronouncing. Simak, uh, I have seen some referees when calling a score uh, say white when they call Wazari white as well. Is that valid? Um, I would not do that. I do not recommend that in any level for you to say that. Again, if you practice correctly, as Jerry and I indicated, we are. If you raise your arm on the left side, the Joseki people, generally speaking, are very, uh, very skillful. And if they're not trained and you feel some tournament, they just use some uh, poor kid to sit on a scoreboard, just point at. You don't use your voice to say white or blue. So just show a signal for Wazari. And if you see there's a need for it, point with your other hand with a finger towards which side. So if it's a Wazari, use a Wazari arm left side and point out on the white side of the tummy on the contest area. And that's another way of indicating that you do not use your voice, no. Okay. Um, Frank Vossen asks, uh, although the topic was gestures, is there still the protocol that your voice is directed at the contestants and your gestures are the, for the benefit of the judges and spectators? Uh, thank you, Mr. Frank Boston, ex Judo Ontario uh, Chair of Committee for Referees. Uh, nice to have Frank here on my behalf, on the committee's behalf. But Frank, yes, I think by turning by turning yourself towards the contestant and facing it and verbalizing your command to the contestant, it's basically indication of it. It's it's not appropriate. It's not proper. It's not a good manners for a referee to look forward, Josaki and announce his, uh, his penalties or gestures without looking at contestant. So as I said through my presentation, turn it slightly towards the contestant that you want to give the penalty to, show your gestures, announce your Japanese expression of the penalty, whatever it is, and uh, by saying Shido and uh, say Hajime. That's what I would do. 
it, I hope that answered uh, Frank's uh, question. Um, I, the next one is from Jury Shevalev. Um, and I wish I could do this sometime. Uh, can you touch or hit contestants to draw their attention if they don't react to your commands? Under no circumstances, ever, <laughs> ever, 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 except Sonamama and Yosh, ever touch a contestant for any reason. There are huge liability. I and Jerry's generation and some of the committee members here, we have been from old school. I remember if your arms would pop out, <laughs> the referee would put your arm back in. Or uh, <laughs> I was in a, as a joke, I, I wasn't in the Canadian national championships. That referee took a took a little pocket knife and cut, helped to cut the contestants tape because the tape was not coming off. So he used his pocket knife to cut the tape. So we don't do that. Never ever touch a contestant for any reason except Sonamama. And and that includes me for medical reasons too. Um, we Liability. used to, like uh, like Mohammed said, we used to help and do what was called uh, I think it's called kappa, which is a older Japanese method of um, first aid for resuscitation, for stopping yeah. nosebleeds and stuff like that. No more. You're not allowed to do that anymore. You always call medical, regardless of how simple it is. Um, you know, if you if you suspect uh, a concussion uh, on a on a contestant, it's not up to you to decide. Call medical. Uh, the other reason why it's it's liability. Um, you're not a medical professional. Even if you are, you shouldn't be doing it. But you're not deemed a medical professional, and you should not be making medical decisions. So, uh, anytime there's a medical uh, decision to be made. Uh, call medical. Uh, Grant Kuramoto asks, is there a difference in the process to award a disqualifying penalty? Is there a difference in how this is signaled when awarding the penalty? Um, I, the question is not very clear for me. Uh, disqualifying, there's a signal. Penalty, yeah. So I guess Hansoku Make Grant? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Grand Kuramoto, international referee, ex Judo uh, Ontario referee committee. Nice to have you here, Grant. Thank you for asking for the question. Uh, basically, uh, the third Shido is a Hansukomake. So you give a one Shido, you get a second Shido. The contestant is being awarded the third Shido. You don't call the Shido anymore. You show the signal of the penalty that he or she has uh, caused false attack, stepping out, whatever the case is. You show the signal as we review you tonight and point of your finger towards the contestant who's receiving it and basically simply call Hansakomake. You don't call the Shido anymore. Um, I think that's probably a grand question was, you don't call the Shido anymore, the third one, the same signal that he's getting or she's getting and then Hansakomake. All right. Um, and uh, Jury Shavalev has another question. After winner announced how judokas walk out fighting area face to face, or can they turn around and walk um, back to back? Thank you for your question. Uh, as I said, they must, after you awarded as a center referee the, uh, the winner, they must step back from where they were when they received the winner. They step back, they do a proper judo bow. They can walk back and shake each other's hands is okay, or they can basically turn around, walk about, they can step back with walking backwards, walk back is unimportant. We cannot enforce their form of exit. We can only force the form of entrance, which is facing each other. And as I said earlier, when they're walking out of the contest area, they don't have to bow to the contest area. They can just walk out, go straight out. Um, Francis Hain asks, I had a contestant sit down and refuse to stand up after being awarded a Nippon. I think you mean Nippon. Uh, there's no N uh, against him following a Seoi Nage, a, a Yoko, uh, Yoko Guruma combination. How is this dealt with? Okay, uh, thanks for your question. 
getting really good questions here. It's a little <laughs> bit unrelated. It's a little bit unrelated, but they're good questions. Um, again, nationally, provincially, and internationally, if the contestant has any um, appeal or request for appeal, they can no longer stay on the mat. If they insist, they can actually be thrown out of the tournament. So, which means their name will be taken off the off the schedule, and even their coaches can be penalized. The only form of contesting a call on the mat is by your coach, come to the Josaki table and brings to the attention of the uh, mat chief or the tournament director. And they are the only power they can review if they wish to. They don't have to. You cannot, you cannot uh, raise uh, request for appeal and expect to be uh, to be pay attention to. We we have a technical knowledge. We have videos. We have uh, slow motion videos. We have supervisors. We have tournament directors, uh, chief referee, sorry, and there are a lot of knowledge in there. So if everybody on the mat agreed it was a throw, for example, for Ipon, and your you as a coach or a contestant think that was unfair, you have no uh, way. To, uh, to uh, appeal the call if all the technical uh, people on the mat, which is the center, the two judges, mat supervisor, and the chief referee, if they all agree with it, there's no way you can uh, raise the appeal. It's really their, their discretion if they wish to review it. If you refuse to mat leave the mat, the center judge, center referee says leave, leave after a few times, you will pay a severe penalty internationally. You'll be thrown off the uh, off the uh, schedule for the next contest. You cannot. You have to leave the mat, and then you can raise your concern. Um, Chris Brown says, uh, in follow up to Grant's question, is there a difference in how the match is awarded for different situations? Exa example: uh, no show disqualifications. So I'm, I'm assuming that this means before the match starts. Uh, the, the job of a center referee to officiate a contest. Um, I'm not an administrator, the center referee. My job is to say Hajime, and then my jurisdiction starts. And when I say Soramade, my jurisdiction is over. So all the administration that you referred to, for example, uh, three matches before, uh, Johnny got injured, broken arm, and the coach has announced that Johnny no longer continue. Uh, David is the next person on the schedule to compete against Johnny. Uh, the administrator of the match uh, directs the referee, brings the, con the other contestant to the mat. The contestant gets invited to the center of the mat. A referee steps forward. Uh, after the contestant bowing, he comes in a contest area, bows to step forward, ready, imaginatively, let's say he wants to start the contest against the against the against uh, his opponent, but he or she, well, in this case, Johnny's not there. The referee step forward, awards the win to the contestant who appear. He steps back. The contestant steps back and bows out, and he or she leaves the contest. That's the, that's the process that we do it. So I don't administer as a referees, the, uh, the Josaki administer. So they need to let me know what's going on and then I act accordingly. Um, yeah, so that, that's in the case of uh, Fusangachi, right? So when, yes. uh, for whatever reason, the, the uh, cont one contestant does not show up and the other one does, or even in the case of a buy, that's uh, the decision is Fusengachi. Um, so uh, Andre from Northwest Territory sent me a picture of, uh, it looks like cat's paw. Uh, that is correct. So uh, any, any grip where, uh, for instance, if white is doing the offending move, if any part of um, white's hand is inside the sleeve of blue, then it would be considered illegal. It's the same thing as putting your thumb or fingers inside the sleeve. So it's considered an illegal um, uh, grip. Uh, one thing to be careful of though, is you can grip, I'm trying to see my picture here. Uh, you can grip 
on top of the sleeve and not have the inside of your palm inside the sleeve. So you have to make sure it, the inside of your, uh, the, the palm part is inside the sleeve. Sometimes they grab outside in a, in a kind of a pocket grip, but yet th that's legal. Anything inside the sleeve, inside the sleeve is illegal. Does that answer your question, I hope? Also, Jerry, if I may um, yeah. add, is the same is the same thing in the case of Nawaza most of, well, all the time happens, uh, if it happens, is about the pants. Is the same rule for the pants. You cannot yes. put your fingers inside the pants and use that as a force to keep the leg of the UK authority uh, away from you or bring, to assist it to bring it to, uh, to block the leg. You cannot put your fingers inside the pants either. Are there any other questions? Even if you want to unmute yourself and want to ask a question, you can, if you don't feel like typing. Yes, please. Uh, yes, I have another question. I said- Can you identify yourself first, please? Uh, Yuri, Yuri Shevila. Thank you. Uh, yes, it won't happen to me uh, on the competition. Uh, well, you know, I, I practice and I do judo in Taiwan. And uh, I was injured in previous fight and I came to tatami, but I couldn't compete. I couldn't participate. And what is the proper way to show that I'm giving up? Um, Yuri, thank you for your asking for your question. Prior to your match, you or your coach as a contestant, um, not, most of the time, well, all the time is your coach. Uh, in a lot of uh, events, they won't allow the contestant to come to Josaki table. Uh, your coach needs to inform the administrator of the event, the tournament director, and tournament director would in return will inform the specific mat because she eyes have three, four mat areas and there are different administrators for each mat. So your coach or yourself need to inform the tournament director and tournament director informs the uh, mat administrator that you no longer want to continue uh and uh they 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 adjust accordingly what they have to do whatever the case is specifically so you can't come to the center of the mat and tell the referee what your needs are or what you wanted to do uh which is still some people do but your really communication as i said earlier my job is to officiate the contest is not to administer a contest so the administrator on a joseki table will uh, act accordingly as you desire mm -hmm. um just for provincial level and for club level um if uh, you, uh, you or your um, athlete can no longer continue, uh, it's okay just to go up to the table. Usually uh, just inform the table uh, official that um, they're, they're injured or they won't be continuing so that they know. Um, on the international, national, international level, the, the Joseki side of the mat is usually uh, blocked off. So access to um, access to the Joseki uh, wouldn't be allowed. Um, there's a question from Chris. Uh, what about gestures for uh, uh, what about gestures for special kids rules? Um, we'll get into the uh, kids, the special kid, the U14, sorry, the U10, U12, U14 rules probably at a later later date. Um, we, we just can't fit everything into, into one um, session. Uh, uh, Rick Coughlin asks, can you put fingers inside your own sleeve during a choke, like Sode Guru Majime? Yes. So the answer is yes. <laughs> you're, you're not preventing, the idea of um, not being allowed to put your fingers in your opponent's sleeve is for you to gain an advantage, unfair advantage over your opponent. Uh, when you're doing it to yourself, uh, you're not giving the um, your opponent uh, a, a disadvantage. So, thank you, Rick. Are there any other questions? This is great. Thank you very much.
Um, before, I think we, our... before we conclude, I yeah. just want to say thank you very much for everyone being here for the opportunity to make my presentation. Uh, there are uh, there are individuals at this seminar from all across this land, many provinces uh, have representative here, and also we have uh, we have a pleasure of uh, a uh, national referee from a country of Iran who is a silver medalist, world silver medalist in uh, in Kimono Kata, uh, many medals internationally, uh, Mr. Yasha Rulazadeh, who is the referee, and I had invited him and he has been here with us uh, since the first one. So I also put for his sake uh, in his language, thank you. And uh, again, Don Arigato. All right, um, just before we go, uh, just a few closing notes. Uh, the next session, um, we have scheduled for April 18th, so that's next month. Uh, I'll be doing the next session, and uh, the topic covered will be uh, uh, match times, uh, start of contest, and we'll be looking at Osaikomi and various Newaza scenarios. So um, on behalf of the uh, JORC, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope you had any, um, the date was uh, Sunday, April 18th. Seven o'clock. Oh, May. Sorry, you're right. May. May. Uh, May. Um, this month is going by too quickly. Sorry. Um, sorry, May 18th. Is that a Tuesday? That's a sun Sunday. Should be a Sunday. Uh, it should be the 16th, Gerald. Is it? Oh, my goodness. Sorry, 16th. I, I guess I was, I'm looking at the wrong calendar. Sorry. <laughs> May 16th. You know what? I had it written right here. So anyway, uh, May 16th, Sunday. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Anyway, thank you very much for everybody for joining. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any other questions, uh, you can email directly. Uh, I think everybody should have my email address by now. Um, Otherwise, uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thanks, guys. Have a Thank great session. Good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, outstanding. Thank you. Thank you.